Hey. Hey, how are you? We're back with Heather. Yeah. She is my credited guru, really, because I realized that I need to know more about credit, you know, our financial health. And uh, we figured that we'll have a really good conversation today about why is credit so important in general? Why do you need to know more about it and make sure that you are being cognizant about checking on the regular basis? But also what we're talking about today, the importance of be, having financial health and having good credit if you want to become a homeowner, right? So okay. if it's someone, yeah. if you are first time home buyer or if you're thinking about upsizing or downsizing, what do we need to know about credit? So that's what I think we're going to start today is just... Okay. Um, I understand that you do a lot of credit repair and you have experience. If you want to chat a little bit about that and then we'll jump in and talk about credit. I do. Thank you so much. So yeah, really being specific with home, with the future, somebody wanting to buy a home, number, there's five things that I say are the tips to having the best credit score that you can have. So number one, you really need to know how credit works. Okay. So yes, you need to talk about that. Yeah, you need to know how credit is going to best serve you and not just the lender or you know a credit card taking all the money off of your interest and late fees. So I always say to people that if you're going to use credit, you need to be really mindful. Why are you financing that item? I mean, obviously if it's a car or a house or something like that, you need to, you need to spread the payments out over years. Mm -hmm. But if you're using credit cards, are you using it because you want something right away and you can't wait to save up and get it? Or are you using a 12 month no interest phase and spacing out your payments and not paying the interest on it. Cause that's just credit cards making money off of you. So if you're being just mindful and purposeful with your spending and your use of credit and fully understand, you know, late fees and interest fees and how the interest rates can vary and can go up based on your payment history, or if you default on a month payment, um, you just really, really need to understand credit. And unfortunately, so much, so many of us really don't ever read the fine print. We don't really read when we're applying for things. We just are so excited that we, you know, got the line of credit that we're just going to use it. So you, everyone just needs to really take it and as a personal responsibility because it's going to somehow impact your future purchases if you don't use credit correctly. So definitely, I say understand how credit works. Number two, pay your bills on time. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Before you go into that, I just wanted to kind of do like a little tips that I'm taking. Out I know. Of yeah. Yeah. So the way I can explain this to someone maybe who does not understand credit is if, you know, you are, the credit card is giving you almost like an interest-free loan for 20 days, right? For a month, really. And then you agree to pay back what the credit card gave you after a month. So really right. it's a short term little loan, but then the goal is, is that you have to pay back. And if you don't, then they have the right to charge you interest because they want their money back. So that's mm -hmm. how they make their money. And what I always tell people is that as much as the short term, the fine print that you mentioned is annoying, is boring, you still have to learn and understand what are the major items to be aware of. Like, you know, if you are late on the payment, you don't pay your card back, this is the interest that's going to be charged. And here's how it's calculated. And what are the fees? So this way, you kind of learn, you know, more. Absolutely. About Absolutely. And just to piggyback off of that, if you miss a payment, even yeah. just one, it can take 12 to 18 months for you to recover your credit score from that one derogatory month with a Mr. Yeah, late payment. I talked about it because I mean, the real estate agent, I actually have a client and we're working through this right now. And it was actually of no fault of hers. This is what happened. And it's, it's devastating to her because this is what I explained to her. This is how long it may take for her to be able to get to where she needs to be. And people don't realize, you know, having... Financial health and having the ability of, of, I think people what people don't realize is that being able to have a credit is actually a privilege. It is. Right? That's what, how I feel, I feel. And then if you really should take care of this privilege to be able to use it wisely. Mm -hmm. so that's You're what absolutely I, that, right. This is what I took out of your first point. All right. What's your second one? Yeah, absolutely. So paying your bills on time. So uh, yes. your credit score is 
based on your ability to be a responsible adult and pay your bills on time. So it's the same with, you know, if you don't pay your mortgage on time, they're going to take your house. If you don't pay your car on time, they're going to take your car. So necessarily a credit card is an unsecured debt, an unsecured loan. It's not secured by anything. They can't take your, you know, your card back. They can close your line of credit, but they can't come and take, you know, the purse you bought. They can't come and take the items that you bought. But they will, you know, very quickly hit you with a late payment and they will very quickly, you know, knock your credit score down, sometimes even 100 points by having one late, like missed or late payment. Um, and then it takes 12 to 18 months to come back that, eight, that, that point from having one, I call it a boo-boo, one boo-boo, one little of a slip up and it can really derail your plans for as long as a year or a year and a half. I have a good so, solution for that, that I always yeah. suggest to, because uh, I'm really passionate about budgeting and financial health in general, is what I tell people is that put your payments for everything on auto payment. Mm -hmm. This way you forget, you don't feel good, you go on vacation, whatever the reason may be, your bills, the, your necessity, the things that you have to take care of every month still get taken care of. Yeah. I agree hundred percent. And now the pushback that I've had with people, especially if they're on the budget or they don't necessarily have like a really dependable income mm -hmm. that they say, well, I can't afford to do that. Then set an alarm on your phone. Okay. Set That's a timer. Do you know what I mean? Like set, set some kind of reminder in a Google calendar or something because it is so important. It's, I mean, it's you, it's, it's your reputation. It's your financial reputation. It's, what, what every future lender is going to judge you on is your payment history with your current account. Yep. And you want to look good. You want to look like you, you know, you are credit worthy. You're worthy of, you know, the money when you really need it and you want to make that next big purchase. They're going to see, you know, well, how well did you pay your capital one and your target card? Because they're surely not going to give you the money to buy a house if you couldn't pay 250 in time. Like it just, so it just, it speaks a lot for you. Um, number three is do not rely on your minimum payments. Okay. So a lot of people, especially young people, if they're not reading the fine print, they're not understanding that the interest is accruing on the purchases that they've made. When you get the bill and it just says minimum amount due. That doesn't mean that's all you pay. <laughs> exactly. You should always pay more than that. Number one, again, if you're being mindful and purposeful with your purchases, then you should already know what you're going to pay that month, whether it be that you're paying the whole balance off, which is ideal, or if you are mindful with using credit and you know that your goal is to pay that bill off in three months, then you're taking the balance, dividing it by three, and you're sending that payment in. And it's definitely going to be more than the minimum balance mm -hmm. payment you know, ne ne needed. When you're only paying the minimum, you're paying majority interest, and a tiny little bit on the principal. So you're really not going to make any dent in the balance because you're just paying the interest. Right. So again, unless you really look at your statement and look at how much of it is interest, how much of it is the purchase that you made and you know all, what all the fees are, you need to be mindful with your purchase. Like I always just tell it, and especially like when you, know, when you have a new homeowner and they're like, I'm going to go buy a new TV and I'm going to buy all new appliances. And I'm like, you need to be careful. Like that is just a, such a slippery slope unless you are being so purposeful with your purchases that, you know, just because you have a line of credit extended to you, if you couldn't afford all those appliances to begin with, you're probably not going to be able to afford the credit card bill unless you're paying more than the minimum balance and paying, you know, the minimum payments and getting those balances down because it's just going to accrue all that interest. So that's a really big, a big thing that people don't, don't look at enough. So what I'm taking from this, I think it's a good idea for people to actually study and get familiar with what their statement looks like, whether it's for a credit card, whether it's for a car payment, because every, all the important information is there for you. It'll tell you everything you need to know. The idea for Google Calendar, I'm a big user of the calendar, mm -hmm is set yourself reminders. And if you think one is not enough, you can actually have it repeat a few times. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah, absolutely. Yes. And that's again, I mean, it is ideal if you can set everything up on auto pay, like especially, you know, with one of those types of credit cards where, you know, you're trying to pay it off before the interest starts accruing or things mm -hmm. like that. Like, again, you just, anytime that you're using credit, you just need to be mindful of it. 
you use it. Don't let it use you. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So um, number four of, of the top tips um, is to avoid high balances on your credit card. So some people say to me, well, you know, yeah, I have a high balance, but like I always pay it on time. I don't understand why my credit score is just staying the same. And I kind of give the idea of, you know, you're trying to climb a mountain. And if you're carrying a lot of weight in your backpack, it's going to take you a really long time to get those steps, to get up, to get up, to get up. If you drop some weight, you pay off some of that balance, your score is going to go up. So I, number one, always try to tell people not to carry a balance more than like a third of their available balance. Okay. If you absolutely have to, then so be it. But again, that's being purposeful. If you're using, if you have an emergency even, and you're using that credit card because all of a sudden you need new tires, mm -hmm. you just need to now be purposeful. Like, oh God, I had to use this credit card and the interest rate is so high, but it's an emergency. I don't have the money to buy these new tires. Then you need to be purposeful with repaying it and know that this is a priority that you need to get this down. When you're carrying that high balance, especially month after month after month, and you're expecting your score to go up because you're not doing anything wrong, mm -hmm. but you're just carrying a whole lot of weight that you don't need to carry. So if you shed some weight, you can climb quicker and your score is going to improve. Sorry, of course my phone rings. But yeah, you're going to, um, to get you know, an increase of score if you're not carrying balances. Those things do just kind of, they just hold you down. They're, and it is, it's a burden. It's, you know, it's some weight on your back when you're carrying high balances. I thought it was a, a scene from a movie where the mom was carrying a book bag and the kids put rocks in it. Their yes, <laughs> it's absolutely right. It's so true. Or even like when I see people that have lost weight and then they put a backpack on with the amount of weight they lost. I mean, it is because, and, I, and we all know anyone that has been, has carried like credit card debt or any debt at all, it weighs on you mentally. It's, you know, wow. it's a stressor. Like you, you want to be rid of it. So the same goes for the effect that it has on your credit score. You know, it kind of affects everything. It kind of just like, it's not really helping you get up there, but you know, it's not hurting you. You're not going down unless you don't pay your monthly bill. But if you're just paying the minimum payment, which we just talked about, it's you're not getting any further up the hill to like, you know, getting it paid off and, and being rid of the debt. Um, yeah, number five of the top five best tips for a good credit score is do not close old cards. Oh, yay. Okay. It's Tell so, me more because it's so, so counterintuitive, I think, because that's not, I would do that. We're done. Right? We're moving on. That's kind of. I agree with you, especially, and now there's so many stores that have actually closed and I like have lines of credit with some stores that aren't even open anymore. But when you close an, a credit card that you're just not using and you think you're better off, you know, why have the temptation? Why have the possible risk of someone else using it fraudulently? you are breaking up with a friend. You are cutting that line um, of credit that you were extended, that you were using. You know, they were one of your buddies. You had them in your wallet in case you needed them. And now all of a sudden you don't want to use them anymore. Well, you are now lowering the amount of credit that you have extended to you. So then you are instantly increasing, you know, your debt and usage amount, like your percentage of credit used versus credit uh, uh, available credit that you have. Um, and it just, it's, it makes your score drop. So I did it. I did it in my young twenties. I figured I'm paying it off and I'm closing it. I don't want the chance of this, to ha you know, I don't want, I don't want to use it. Then, then cut it, cut it up, but don't close it. What do you think? Like what kind of a credit drop can that Effect. I think recently, recently I saw someone where it dropped 30 points. That's a lot. It is a lot, especially like, you know, if you're about to buy that house and you are right there Up the border. and that, yep. And then you have this drop right before a settlement. Mm -hmm. And that's it's so sad because that individual did nothing wrong. Right. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't miss a payment. They didn't, you know, they didn't run up their debt. They didn't do anything wrong. They figured they were being very financially smart and healthy by eliminating possible debt because now they're buying a home and just for lack of information, they hurt themselves. Wow. Good point. All right. Absolutely. Is it, oh, I know another huge, huge thing that I'm sure that you run into credit monitoring services. 
So Let's such talk as, about those. Tell me yeah. more about Credit okay. Karma because we hear it all the time. All what the time. Yes. Yes. Okay. So credit monitoring services are phenomenal. They are great for their purpose. They are to monitor the credit. They are to tell you if you have a problem. They are to alert you if there's purchase activity, fraudulent activity, if someone you know requested a line of credit in your name. Having that available to you is huge because by not checking your credit on a regular basis, you don't know what might be going on that you know, you're in the dark about. The problem that we run into um, in my business and in yours is when people put too much strength on the scores that Credit Karma or the other credit monitoring services tell you, like what are your FICO scores? Credit monitoring services are for informational purposes pretty much only. Okay. okay, they are not risk based. They are for informational purposes. They are telling you this is what you have. This is what you, these are your accounts. You've paid all your bills on time. Oh, look, your score is climbing. You're doing good. And they will also offer suggestions of how your score can go up. They'll give you scenarios, which I think is all wonderful. I love it all. Use it only for informational purposes. When it really comes time for you to make a purchase, please do not hold stock in the scores that you see on your app. Because when a lender pulls your credit for either a car loan or a mortgage, the score is going to be different and it could be substantially different. The risk based on you know something on Credit Karma is looking at what your score is and really with a risk base of like opening a credit a capital one card. That's somebody saying that, you know, okay, your score is like a 620, a 640, you can get this credit card, that credit card. Those are things with maybe a maximum available balance of we're saying maybe a thousand dollars. So when you now go to a mortgage lender and they run your credit, they are looking at completely different criteria and risk base. Okay. So the, the risk of that lender offering you hundreds of thousands of dollars, they are judging you on completely different criteria than Capital One is. Okay. So what are they looking for? Like what I get this all the time in, cause you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a realtor and there's like, well, my, my credit karma said that I'm 620 and that is what I need to get my, you know, a government insured FHA loan. So I'm in good shape. And they actually get mad at us they, when yeah. we tell them that, you, that they're not ready. We need to do some more work. So what is so different about what does the lender look at when they pull the credit? It is a way more extensive credit pull. It probably looks back even a longer period of time than you know what's on your Credit Karma or your app um, reporting services. It is going to see, again, there's different calculations as far as how much credit you have and how much credit you're using. Right. Uh, there is, every bank is completely different as far as their lending criteria. So I'm sure that you've seen that you might have someone get pre-approved with Wells Fargo and the amount of credit, the interest rate, and what, you know, what they're saying you qualify for can be completely different than if you now get somebody pre-qualified with Summit or Loan Depot or somebody else. Every bank is going to have their own rules and criteria and their calculations for, for if they want you and you know, how much money they're going to loan to you. So every bank is specific as far as what they're looking at, but there's just there's percentages and calculations of, again, how long you've had credit. So mm -hmm. the length of your credit history is huge. Okay. So if you do start when you're 18 and now, you know, you're approaching 40 and you have always used credit responsibly, you're going to, you know, have a lower interest rate. You're going to have a larger loan amount based on your income, obviously, but you're going to have more loan opportunities and that bank is. Yeah. So that's what I tell them, like best terms best rate, best options, more choices, right? Because you have- a, a You have the power. You right. have the power to make the choice. Like it's go. amazing. Yeah, it's amazing when I, you know, work with someone that has ideal credit, you know, has never had any hiccups or problems. And just that they can like have the pick of the litter. Like that they can just say like, oh, this, this bank's doing that? Oh, I'm just going to go with them. And there's like no risk in their or, or thought in their mind that they could possibly be denied mm -hmm. versus when, you know, I work with an individual that is trying to repair their credit and we are just scrounging to get them to a 620 so that we can just get them approved by an FHA lender and just get them in the door. Like, 
and you feel at, at their mercy, which is just so terrible. Like, and it's such a stressful experience versus knowing what you want, being mindful with your use of credit, being careful with your use of credit, and then you taking the control. Like the best is when you have all the power and all the banks want you as a client versus you trying to beg a bank to give you a loan. So give me an example of what that target credit score that we should all strive for, where we have the power to pick the bank and just say, I'm going to go with this loan in these terms because, and I'm going to go with bank A, and I'm sorry, you guys, I don't, I can't work with you. Yeah. Anything 800 and above is like the, the, the goal and okay. not everyone is ever going to reach that because, and, and there's varying reasons as to why you won't reach that at different times of our lives, we might have different loans open or different, you know, we'll, we'll have our daughter's student loan plus my car and his credit card and all of these things. And even though you're paying them perfectly, mm -hmm. you might just have a little bit too much debt to get you up to 800, but it's not a bad thing. You know what I mean? Okay. So, you know, most of the time it ends up being um, like, I laugh, like my grandparents, you know, no mortgage, no car loan. Like they have, you know, a Boscov card and mm -hmm. they've used it perfectly. They've never had a hiccup in their life and their score is an 850. So, you know, it really, it, it, it's like the stellar of the most stellar, but that is always the goal would be, you know, 800 and above, but anything in the sevens is fantastic. And you can see, like, you can Google what the scores are and you can always like look at different scenarios as to your specific credit history right now and what changes you can make to get there. Mm -hmm. So, and again, it always really does come down to knowledge. Knowledge is power. We hear that all the time. Yep. knowing, knowing the downfalls and the benefits of financing anything is huge. Yep. You know, like just because, you know, a bank is telling you they can give you that car loan that, you know, uneducated individual is not realizing that he just financed a car for eight years <laughs> for, yep. you know, $400 a month and yep. what the car is ultimately costing him. He's just so excited. He got approved. Exactly. So, Things like that are, you know, again, where we kind of were talking about the last time that we spoke is how we have to educate our children to make really good financial decisions, because that will set them up as adults. And they will really, the world is your oyster. If you have always used credit perfectly, then you can always have opportunities that aren't necessarily avail available to everybody, you know, if you don't use credit to your advantage and in a responsible manner. I hear you. All right. What other tips you have for me? <sighs> um, always a good mix of credit. So you don't want to be like credit card heavy. That's too much revolving debt. Um, it's always good to have. And the weird thing that always makes me mad is no one can ever tell you the perfect recipe. Like no one can, even if, even if you Google it, there's no, no one can actually say what's a good amount of credit cards and what's a bad amount of credit cards. Okay, so yeah. credit card is revolving debt because this is something that you pay every month, right? That's what that's called. Yeah, it's revolving. It's like a revolving door. So you can pay something, buy something, pay it off, buy something, pay it off, buy something, pay it off. An installment loan would be right. like taking a personal loan or a car loan um, where it has a term. Okay. So you, those are fixed, a fixed interest rate for a fixed term. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, very specifically either a personal banking loan or an auto loan because it's, you know, you are committing to five years at this payment, at this interest rate. And at the end of the term, the credit line is done. Right. So that's another, that's another thing where I've actually seen someone score drop a little bit when their car loans paid off. Uh, have you ever seen, have you ever heard of that? Yes. You've told me that because you, you get all excited, right? And you think this is awesome. But based on what I heard you say is it's actually a little bit of a bad thing because that open line is now closed. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I've actually had my lender friend be like, hurry up and tell him to go open a credit card. Like <laughs> hurry up, hurry up and tell him to go get a little personal loan from their bank. And like, I, you know, I, I think I, should, I said in a conversation with you, it, depending on where you bank and their lending opportunities, mm -hmm. one of the best things that we do just to keep like a, a nice healthy line of credit with, you know, and different lines of credit again, like, if all of a sudden you pay off your installment loan and again, you just have revolving debt and you don't have any installment accounts and your score drops at all, you could just go to your bank. I, I walked into TD and I decided that I was going to finance a project that I was doing on my home. 
And the only reason I did it was because the interest rates were super low. And I, again, I was mindful. I was mindful. Like if I drain my savings account right now to redo my bathroom, that's going to hurt. What if I do this? And, you know, explored my options. And by doing that, number one, I gave myself a little bit of a security blanket and knowing that I wasn't, you know, draining my, what is it, rainy day fund. Exactly. Um, and then I was just mindful and took out an installment loan that was on auto pay. Right. You know, I used what I needed to put the rest in the savings account and it just pays itself. Like, and then number one, I definitely got a boost in credit score because I was bestowed a new line of credit. And now I'm paying it on time every month. And when it's over, you know, I'll make the choice whether I want to take another loan if I need to for any purposes, or maybe I won't need to. But always having a good mix of your credit is, is good for you. And obviously, the, the cream to the crop is a mortgage. So usually I see people like within the first six months of them getting their mortgage for the first time, you're going to see a nice increase in your credit score. Interesting. So you know mm-hmm. what I'm taking out of this is that having loans overall, if you're being mindfully, you know how they work is not a bad thing. No. And especially like not just not a lot of them. It's always like, you know, again, being purposeful and number two, being responsible with it. So, you know, when I chose to do that, it was because I didn't have any other debt. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I'm certainly not going to hurt myself. I can absolutely afford what the monthly payment is. I could pay it off sooner if I choose to. But if the interest rate is so low and it is a set term, like it's not accumulating new interest. Installment loans, they're not accumulating anything additional. It's all written in. Like the exact amount that you're going to pay for that item or that loan is already like established for you. So by doing it that way and me holding on to the money that I had was the best option for me in that moment. And I definitely, you know, saw a score increase from it because I really didn't have anything else reporting on a monthly basis. Like I also, you know, sometimes with my, with my credit clients, I try to say, you know, yes, I'm asking you to use your credit card every month for 20 bucks because I just need you to use it. I just need something reporting. So if you aren't using any lines of credit, any credit cards, you paid off your car. I mean, you know, even if we're all at the point where we've paid off our mortgage, you go stale. Like you need something reporting and showing that you still have the, the, the capability of paying things responsibly on time. That's what keeps your credit score active and keeps your, your credit score high is just that constant, you know, responsible use of credit. Even putting groceries on your credit card and yep. just paying that off every month. All Absolutely. Right. And like you said, the using the cards that have cashback rewards mm-hmm. or miles, mm-hmm. like again, that is using credit to your benefit. Yes. I love that. I love that. Uh, one of good websites that we talked about is nerdwallet.com. Yeah. I will put that in, in the, in the chat box below, but If one of the things that I am a big proponent on is if you're going to get credit cards, make sure that those cards work for you, Mm -hmm. meaning that they have either cash back or you earn miles or depending on whatever it is that you are excited about, right? I like cash back because then I take that money, I use it as I see fit, right? You can use that as like even a little bit of a savings account. Yeah. Right. Because that money accumulates and until you're ready, it just sits there and then you can just ask them to send it to you right back. So use that website to kind of figure out. Oh, froze. Ooh, you did too a little bit. Um, I don't know if it's my just, internet or yours, but we froze. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. So just figuring out which credit cards fit your style and maybe your financial. And your lifestyle. Absolutely. What your needs are. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about things not to do, right? The mistakes that you can make. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, we just covered don't don't close don't close cards. Yes. Don't close them up. Even if you don't want to use them, just cut them. But sure. don't you know? Just don't close the accounts out. Carrying high balances. So I made that analogy of like trying to climb a mountain carrying a whole bunch of weight. Um, a late payment can you yeah. know close to twelve to eighteen months to recover from that. Um, oh, applying for too much at once. Okay. So, Sure that, yeah, I'm sure that you've seen this. The worst, and, and people have no idea, and it's not their fault. If you're trying to finance a car, mm-hmm. they the car dealership will I uh, like go fishing. They'll go fishing for the best loan for you. And when you say look at your credit score in the next like 30 days for any reason, you're gonna see like maybe 10 hits 
on your credit, like inquiries. Right. So you're going to see all these inquiries because they were shopping all these different banks to try to get you approved or get you the best rate in payment. Um, oh, trying to get too many things at the same time, the that like Experian, Equifax and TransUnion, like they'll, they'll actually put a notation on there, too many inquiries. Yep. I've seen and then it, yeah. it kind of sets an alert, like, what are you doing? Why all of a sudden are you so interested in, in all this financing? What are you, you know, are you at a bad place in your life and you can't afford anything and you're trying to max? So it, it actually sometimes can, it will cause a drop in score. They want to make you look unworthy because the banks get nervous. Like, it, did she lose her mind? What is she doing? Like, why is she, especially if it's just not your norm, if it's not your normal behavior, because again, your history is there. Mm-hmm. They know what your normal spending patterns are. They know how frequently, you know, you apply for new lines of credit or because there's tons of people and especially like in your business, you know, you have investors that buy things, sell things, finance this, finance that. That is their normal pattern of of credit usage. The average, you know, housewife, all of a sudden, if I go and apply for 10 things, that's going to set an alert and they're going to be like, what is number one? Is it fraud? Number two, you know, did she lose her mind? Number, like, who, you know, this is just not normal behavior. And they will put notations on your credit report that, you know, unusual spending, unusual inquiries, too many inquiries in a 12 month period. And all of those things can hurt you when it, when you actually want to purchase something. Got it. So yeah, so applying for too many things in a short period of time is, is not a good idea. You know what? I ran into this question when I have clients who are, looking at different mortgage companies and they're like, well, how can I shop to see who gives me the best, you know, rate in terms if they're not able to pull my credit? So do you have any That's a fantastic question. Yeah. That is that is specific and that the banks know the difference. So that is called rate shopping. If you are rate shopping, that is completely understandable. It is completely allowed. Okay, so, good. I mean, I usually, when I'm talking to someone and we're trying to get them financed for a mortgage, I try not to do more than two or three. I mean, you really should know when you even have two, two offers okay. or two pre-approvals, right. which one is, is most ideal for you. If mm-hmm. you need to do a third, then do a third. But usually like someone would um, tend to go with where they bank. So mm-hmm. I just, you know, had someone that was like, well, I really, I really love Wells Fargo. I want to see what their loan opportunities are. And then I had someone, and then I suggested, I said, well, why don't you also see what the rates are with this lender, you mm-hmm. know, because it's a mortgage broker and they can cast a bigger net and find you a loan. So when you are rate shopping, that will not cause any drastic drop in score. And usually it's within a specific time though. So with, right. when we're working with someone to try to find a home, it can really hurt though, if it, if it takes them so long to find a house. So they, they got the pre-approval and then it still took you six, six months and you have to pull again. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not going to be any huge detriment to them as long as they've used credit responsibly within that time period. But when you are specifically rate shopping and you've had three lenders pull your credit within 30 to 45 days, the banks understand that you're about to make a large purchase and you are exploring your options. Awesome. Okay. So it's called rate shopping. So that's, mm-hmm. I think they also call it a soft pull. Yeah. Well, the soft pull is at the end, usually closer to when you're um, about to close. Okay. Got it. So have you ever had it where um, your person had to write a letter of explanation for why there was a a, a credit inquiry? Did you ever see that? Okay. So if anything was pulled when what, like what Olga just said, a soft pull, once you're in the mortgage process, you will go all the way. And once you're, it used to be 10 days prior to closing now, because of COVID it's three. Um, three days before closing, they do what's called a soft pull on your credit report. They want to pull it and make sure that you did not go and buy all your appliances at Home Depot. You didn't run to Marie Warren Flanagan and have all of your furniture purchased and you did not increase your debt load. Right. That's what it's about. So if all of a sudden you have a new inquiry on your credit report, that underwriter at the mortgage company is going to ask for a letter of explanation and say, why did you apply for a new loan of credit? Right. And did that substantially result in a new line of credit and new debt? Right. So in effect, you being able to buy ultimately the house that we're. Yep. Yep. So that's why, you know, that you always tell your people do not go and buy a car until you have the keys in your hand. Don't buy anything until you leave settlement. You cannot purchase anything from the time that you, you know, go under agreement 
until you get handed the keys. Do not make any changes in your financial situation. Awesome. Do you have any other mistakes or things to go over? Okay. I think I, I mean, I think I covered some, you know, like, I mean, missing payments, carrying too much debt. Yeah. I think for the most part, I, I think I got everything. All right. Talk to me about debt to income ratio. We hear okay. it all the time. I think this is a lot of the times the starting conversation where a lot of lenders ask us like regular humans to say, okay, this is how, this is where we talk about your financial health. So what is a debt to income ratio? Why is it important? Your debt to income ratio is really important. Um, and that's why it's also really great um, to talk to a lender between six and 12 months prior to when you actually want to purchase, because a lender can discuss with you what your debt to income ratio are is, and they're probably going to call it your DTI. DTI. They're going to discuss your DTI. That means how much debt you have versus the income that you bring in. So your income that you bring in, your debt cannot exceed a certain percentage of your income. Each lender is different and each mortgage specific, every, what is it? Um, product, because they call mortgages products. Mm -hmm. Every product is different as far as the DTI that they will allow. So ideally what I have seen is that they really didn't want you to have a DTI higher than like 43% of your income and it can vary. So well, like let's, every- Let's break this down a little bit. 43% means what? Of your bring home pay. You can't have bills that exceed 43% of what you bring home from your from your job. Got it. So if your income is $1,000, let's make it easy math, then your debt cannot be more than $430 a month. Sure, Got it. yeah. And that's total, that's total oh. debt. So yeah. they take all of your monthly payments. So right. again, this is why it's so important to sit down with a lender before you like fall in love with the house, because he may tell you, you have to pay off this, this, and this because your DTI is too high. So if you are not going to qualify for a new $1,500 mortgage payment, mm -hmm. because your car loan, your capital one, your student debt, and you know, your timeshare all your monthly payments total. So they're going to take, you know, the set, the 400 for your car, the, the, you know, your monthly payment on your credit card, they're going to bunch them all up into one payment. What your total monthly payments are cannot be more than 43% of your bring home pay. Got it. So that yeah. is your debt to income ratio. And it's very easy to figure out. Like everyone, again, should be writing down your budget. You should, you should know what you're spending, mm -hmm. you know, monthly. And then that is when a lender is going to tell you what you can reasonably afford. All right. So if somebody is coming and telling me, Olga, we are thinking about buying a house. Ultimately, the goal is, I think what, what I'm hearing you say is that when you are starting to think about it, or even if you're not thinking about it and you're saying, you know, now we are at the end of the year and you say, well, maybe next year I'm, we're thinking about buying a house. We should tell them, let's sit down with the lender now and start planning, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Absolutely. But besides debt to income ratio in terms of credit, what else do you think people should know about credit or what to plan for in terms of financial health to be better prepared to be, be you know, to be in the best position to become? Absolutely. Healthy? Great question. So it's, especially if you, hopefully you have a wonderful realtor that is going to put you in the direction of a very trusted Mm -hmm. um, lender that is really going to give your client the time right. because a lot of, especially if it's a first time home buyer, they really need the time. They need this process explained to them and they need the, the credit and the lending process explained to them. So if you have a good lender that is going to sit down with you and say, you know, hi, Jack and Sally, I just pulled your credit and you know what you guys are doing great. Your scores are fantastic. Based on what you have right here, I could qualify you for, you know, $300,000 purchase price, and you can afford a monthly payment of $1,800 a month. That might blow their minds because they may, and I'm sure you've seen this, a lot of times you're actually qualified for more than you would be comfortable sending yeah. monthly. Mm -hmm. And those lenders don't know that you like to eat out a lot, or you don't want to like change, you know, how often you get to run, you know, and go shopping or whatever your lifestyle is. So by sitting down with a lender and them explaining to you, you know, oh, side note, your score is great, but if you pay off 
this card, that card, and the last 1200 on this student loan, I can now qualify you for a prime rate of 2.89%. And you can, you know, so it's so important for a lender to, number one, tell you like your current financial health based right. on your credit score, tell you if there's any questions or concerns. So if he sees on there and he goes, did you buy a car recently? Or did you have anyone pull your credit a lot? Either you can say yes, or you can say no, and you can try to fix and look into that if there is potentially a problem or fraud. So that's really important. And number two, just setting you in the right position. Like if he says, you're good to go, I can, I can get you a house today. And they might say, oh, no, I really want to save for a higher down payment. And he says, fine, but don't get any new debt. Mm -hmm. Keep paying, keep paying, doing what you're doing. You know, don't open any new lines of credit. Like they just, it's good to just give you a roadmap, you know, really tell you, take a look at your financial health and then tell you if there's any tweaks that you can make that right. would put you in a better position when you are ready to start looking. And what people don't realize is that there are some hiccups on that credit report and the lender tells them, listen, you really need to pay this down or pay this off. It may take our clients six to 12 months to do that. To do it. When they're in position and people don't realize that, you know, it's not like, a lot of people can do, sure, I'll just drop five to $7,000 and I'll pay exactly. it for one month. So people don't realize that sometimes making these changes to get you in the best shape take time, take months. And also what we talked about that I think is important also to mention again is the fact that you should check your credit yourself on your own as well uh, from all three credit bureaus. It doesn't cost anything because they're required to provide you with a free report once a year. And if you spread it throughout the year, right, you can do one credit agency in the uh, uh, springtime, another in the summer, and the third one in the winter. You need to start checking your credit ahead of time, a year potentially or longer before you thinking about buying to make sure there's nothing on there that shouldn't be on there. You're right. absolutely right. Absolutely. And, and it, it, it pains me when I do meet someone that literally just always thought that they were fine. And then, you know, now they've, they, you know, they don't want to renew their lease. They're ready to buy. We're ready to go. And I'm like, no, you're not, you know, and it, that it's so hard. Like I even recently had clients that they did such an amazing job and saved $12,000. $12,000. They're like, we, we saved up $12,000 for a down payment. We're ready to go. And they had $9,000 worth of collection. Oof. And when I told them, you're not going to get qualified without paying these collections, they're like, well, that's our house money. We can't, we can't say that. That's our house money. And I said, you're not going to get the house. Yeah. You, can't, you can't put the cart before the horse. So they were initially devastated that they had in their mind worked that hard to save up that money. But unfortunately it was because they weren't paying all of their bills like they should have. They were saving for a house. So I had to, you know, kind of calm them down and then educate them that, okay, great. You have the ability to save. That's awesome. But now you have to have the ability to pay your bills and save. <laughs> so we had to like recalculate what they were doing and pay the collections off and keep them current on everything. Cause that's what people, you know, once you have a hiccup, it can just be such a tidal wave, like, yes. you know, so, and that's what happened for this young couple, you know, they were trying, they were doing such a great job, but they defaulted on a couple things. And then it was just like, Oh, well, forget it. We we're we're really saving, we're saving up. And I'm like, you can't get a mortgage if you owe T-Mobile $1,300. Like, well, Fargo isn't going to trust you with 200000 if you can't pay 1300 And people, I don't know why people think that if they just stop paying, it's, things are going to go away. No, they don't the go bills, away. The bills don't go away. They only get higher and worse. And as time drags on, it gets worse. So I always tell people, you know, yes, things can happen, right? They do. But just just catch up and own it. Just on, do it. Yeah. Figure out a plan of action. Figure out how many, how much time it's going to take you to get back on your feet. But don't just ignore it. <laughs> don't just think. It's well, the biggest misconception. I'm glad that you just brought that up. Is I always get the whole seven to ten year rule. So okay. people always say to me like, "Well, it's almost been seven years. I'm just going to wait for it to fall off." And I'm like, "Okay, it doesn't work that way." So 
I don't know if it really did legitimately work that way years ago, but I mean, for at least the 10 plus years that I've been specializing in this, what I typically see is by the six or seven year mark, a lot of times that collection company sells it to a new collection company and then they get Not all over again. To come out. Yeah, then they get their time to come after you because they buy debt from each other. Right. So, you know, and ultimately, you know, when people were doing the whole disputing thing, I would get so frustrated. They're like, well, I disputed that. And I'm like, well, why did you dispute it? Is it not your account? And they're like, well, no, it's my account. You okay. have to pay it. You have to pay it. So by disputing it, and people would say, well, I wrote a letter and they have to remove that. And I'm like, if your best friend borrowed $500 from you and didn't pay you, but they wrote you a letter <laughs> and said, I'm disputing, I'm disputing that I owe you this money. Are you going to forget that they owe it to you? Or are you always going to be a little bitter and say, you still owe me $500? So that's how the banks are. You and know what I mean? Actually, $500 in interest because companies don't just say so, $500. Yeah, you have the late, late fees and the, yeah, the constant rollover. So, I mean, and a lot of times with, with those older collections and things like that, the, the collection companies or even the original bank, they will work with you, whether it be a payment plan or a lot of times you can settle the debt for less. Right. But people not, like, can't just like, kind of put their head in the sand and be like, I don't know this. I don't know this. Right. Until they want to make such a large purchase like a home and it derails their plans. Yeah, because especially if someone, like I just said, is coming to the end of their lease, they absolutely hate where they're living. They thought that they put themselves in the perfect position to be able to buy a house, you know, within the next couple months. And I tell them, you are no closer to buying a house now than you were a year ago, you know, and it, you get that pushback initially. And then I'm just like, you know, I understand if you don't believe me or you're hoping that I'll have a better answer for you. But if you go talk to a mortgage lender, they're going to tell you the same thing. Right. All right. So here's what I'm taking out of this, right? The number one, if someone is thinking about buying a house and it doesn't cost them anything is to talk to the lender at least a year before just to see where they're at and there's anything that they need to do to make sure that they're in the best position, right? Absolutely. Uh, then number two, I would say is just check and see how their financial is and health is and where their credit is. They can pull their own credit and just see where they're at. Uh, and also we, we didn't touch up on that, but that's another time for another class is, uh, you know, people need to save up money to buy a house. Yeah. It, it, it's, there's money that involved with you uh, having a down payment, but there's also closing costs that are involved to buy the house. So there's definitely saving uh, involved. And again, meeting with a good lender, they should even like run a scenario. You know what I mean? Right. Like if you just, if you just run a scenario on one, two, three main street that might currently be, be on the market, it would be so beneficial to have that lender say, this is what it would cost for you to buy one, two, three main street. Yes. And that person might go, Oh my God, I thought that I only have to have 3.5% down. And they're not being mindful of the loan origination costs and the notary fee and the title fee. And Mm -hmm. Like there's just, there's so much involved that, uh, you know, every individual is not privy to. Awesome. All right. Any final thoughts, anything else that you want to add to this? Just oh, again, always be purposeful and mindful with your purchases. Your, your money is, it can either build you a beautiful life or it can just slip through your hands. So mm -hmm. as long as you're being intelligent with your purchases and, and using credit to your benefit, then you can have whatever you want. And I also think it's important to, it's okay to ask for help if you don't have Oh yeah. And it's okay to do the research and it's okay to reach out to people who are knowledgeable and do this for a living because we're talking about making a big decision in your life, spending, you know, borrowing thousands of dollars to buy something that you potentially are gonna own for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, I always tell people, you know, if you don't know something, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help or seek answers to your questions or find out who can help you. There's Absolutely. I always say there's never a silly question. That's what I say to every one of my clients when I'm working with them. I don't care if it is, if you think it's the dumbest question in the world or, and I don't like, like using the word dumb, a silly question. If I can give you the comfort of knowing the answer and just ease your worry or ease your mind or if it, it you know like that's what I, that's what we're here for that's why we are skilled and, and knowledgeable in our you know specific areas of expertise so that there's just never a silly question if it's going to help you you know get to the finish line quicker and make sure that you don't make future mistakes 
That's what, you know, with my goal when I'm helping people fix their credit is that they will never need me again. That would be cool. That would be good. Yeah, that's always so, my goal is that I'm educating them as to how to get out of this problem, but to never make this mistake again. So your specialty is helping out, helping people rebuild and get back on their feet with their financial health and their credit. And you've been doing it for how many years now? It'll be 11. I know. And I, I know that it's your, it's a passion of yours, right? So tell it me is. about that. It is. Well, I mean, it came from like absolute necessity. So my own, yeah, my husband had credit issues when I met him. Um, and again, like I, now I tell my girlfriends that you should be asking yeah. tutors, tutors what your credit score is. And if you have any debt that I should know about, um, because once you marry them, you're kind of marrying their debt as well. Absolutely. So I, yeah, I, you know, learned how to have an extremely tight budget because we had four children and a fifth on the way. And I just learned the importance of every single month, every, every month that we were paying those bills, it had to be on time so that we had all these months clean and perfect. And we're building his credit, his credit score back up to get him to the, you know, the capability of being able to have the lending options that we needed to have. So, you know, it, and then once I started doing it professionally, it just was so heartwarming and rewarding to be able to see people that when I met them were completely clueless and devastated and felt like they were never, ever going to be able to own a home to, you know, seeing them with a picture out front of their new home and them texting me like, I can't believe I did it. You know what I mean? Like, and, and ultimately that is it. They do it. it. Like I can tell someone what to do to get out of financial problems, but ultimately you're, you have to pay your bills on time every month. You have to not overspend. You have to be really calculated with your, you know, your purchases and your choices. Mm -hmm. And that's what's ultimately going to make sure that you're financially sound, hopefully for the rest of your life. And that you, you also teach that to your children and your grandchildren. Yeah. Well, I will put your contact information and underneath this video. So that way, if anybody who watches this, who may want to seek your advice, they know where to find you, but this has been amazing. I learned a lot, which is one oh, of the good. reasons why I've been wanting to talk to you for such a long time. So thank you so much for spending a morning with me. Thank you. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll come up with probably another couple of topics that we can probably talk about. Absolutely. And if any of your viewers have specific questions, then we'll have some, some other, you know, intentional meetings that we can build off of. Absolutely. All right. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Heather. Bye-bye. Take Bye. care.